afternoon. Thank you all for coming on a hot afternoon to uh, listen to me speak. Um, I first of all want to uh, let you know how great it is to come back home. Yes, it is a long journey, but it's worth it. And um, well, um, everybody is going out of their um, yeah, out of their way to make me comfortable. And uh, I'm glad I have been part of this uh, Indo-US project. And uh, with your permission, I want you to recognize uh, the team that has been working hard on this. Give them a big hand of and, uh, congratulating them on their hard work. Uh, we made some uh, great progress uh, on the project uh, so far and definitely we're looking forward to more. Um, well, the topic given to me is called uh, Quality Sustenance in Higher Education. So I want to divide this up into three parts. Obviously the quality and of course the sustenance and the connecting factor there is higher education. Definitely higher education is something that is going to be important whether it is India or in the United States. Well, let's therefore talk about what's quality. So quality can be different things for different people or different uh, scenarios. We typically say quality can be measured by excellence. Could be from a student or our customer perspective, value for money. Am I getting my money's worth? And from a future perspective, it could be, is my education preparing me for, see, I probably, I'm being too close to this. Can you hear me? All right. So, um, from a student uh, perspective, am I prepared for work? is something that they are interested in. Of course, uh, from our perspective here, the parents are interested even more about whether their children are ready for work when they finish college. But still, how do we distinguish ourselves from someone else? Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, we come up with metrics. Metrics as in what? We define our metrics. We, uh, how do we measure greatness? How do we measure quality? That's something that we need to think about. So, uh, what I want to tell you is, uh, first of all, we're all teachers, but we were once students. We teach the way we learn. But the people today, the students today are learning differently. Our teaching methods have been the same. So what we need to do is we need to look at what are the different ways in which we can teach so the learners with different uh, styles can learn. That is something that we often fail to notice, you, me, both included. Okay, it doesn't matter how long we have taught, we're used to somebody standing up front like this and lecturing when the last row may be sleeping, somebody may be browsing the net, or they may be texting their friends, whatever it may be. So we need to engage students in the learning. That's something that we need to be thinking about as well. Another aspect that uh, has come to uh, great importance today is the following. When most of us were growing up, 
I don't want to let you know how old I am, but uh, uh, when most of us were growing up, our parents would probably scold us if our grades were falling. Okay. Today, the parents blame it on the college. So, to that extent, we're all accountable for someone's success or someone's failure. They probably don't uh, worry about it, telling us how great we did when they succeed, but they do remind us that we're not doing our jobs when they don't succeed. So, accountability is something that we ought to be keeping at the back of our minds when we talk, when we teach. So, I've talked about three things now. We need to tell ourselves how we are going to measure quality. We're going to engage students by changing the way we teach. And finally, we need to understand that we are accountable. So those are the, the you know, uh, what, what should I say, ingredients, if you will, of uh, what amounts to quality. Is this, that's, that's the way I, uh, I feel about it. I am not an expert on uh, higher education uh, in India because I separated from the education system when I uh, got my master's degree about 35 years ago. And I am reinserting myself into the system by learning to see how different things work. But I must tell you, and I can, I think, with some authority here, that our elementary and high school systems are probably one of the best in the, in the world here in India. I'm not talking about the United States. Okay. So we hope it's not going to stop at just talking. We hope we're going to continue our conversation and take the next step, take the next step, and take the next step, and climb onto where we want to be. Okay, well, I'm, I promised my friends I'm going to talk about Big Boss. <laughs> Is there anyone who does not watch Big Boss here? Okay, we're not missing much, but it's okay. Um, the reason I brought that up is, uh, although we, you know, it's all interesting to see, you know, that the fights, the eliminations, and so on and so forth. Uh, as the host correctly pointed out, it is a social experiment. But what is more important about it is, it is what we call an opportunity for introspection. Okay, so that is where we are when we talk about sustaining quality. Okay, so I'm saying, where are we? What should we do to move ahead? Once again, I emphasize that. So that is where you know, our introspection has to happen. We all come from different backgrounds, different disciplines, different kinds of uh, ways in which we were taught. But again, we are in our silos doing things our own ways. We have to come together and then talk about, you know, what is it that is a common thread in uh, higher education. Okay, that is what uh, is going to tell us how we can get to the quality that we think we are to achieve. Okay, some uh, initial thoughts based on what I uh, Googled, of course. Okay, uh, the learning of the students, as I mentioned before, has changed. Okay, my four-year-old grandson switches off the phone, switches on the phone, and, and hits on the mic and says, "How do you spell yellow?" And the Google assistant spells the word yellow for him. That's not how we were taught. In a class of 200 students, suddenly when the teacher is teaching, his phone vibrates. The student in the first row has just sent him a text asking him a question. That's how they ask questions. We used to raise hands. Okay. 
we're not thinking about all of that when we teach. We just stand and lecture like I'm doing now. Okay, so we need to engage. We need to find ways in which we want to engage our students. So, after so having said all that, I still Google last night because, as I said, I'm not an expert in the Indian system of higher education. So I wanted to find out if there's anything out there that talks about quality and quality sustenance in higher education in the Indian system. Well, to my pleasant surprise, I found a doctor, Father Davis George. Okay, if it was a PowerPoint, I would have given you a link where he has actually outlined what he calls steps towards sustaining quality in higher education. The person is Dr. Father Davis George, if in case someone is interested. And of course, Google his name, you should see the, this article. Okay. So I'm not going to really go over the article or uh, get you stuff from there and repeat it like it's my own. But I wanted to learn something before I came up here and talked. So I, I kind of studied it. And then I brought some, um, I extracted some um, aspects of it, uh, what, what he had outlined, and I compared it to what I know from uh, U.S. higher education system. So here are things that I'm going to uh, uh, outline as to what I learned uh, from it, but I am putting it in my words uh, based on uh, what is uh, working in the uh, U.S. system. First, we um, have stakeholders in our uh, in higher education, our students are the st biggest stakeholders. Our community is another stakeholder. Our uh, industries are uh, another big stakeholder. But we always talk about these. One important component or one important or another important stakeholder that we are not taking into account any time is ourselves faculty or stakeholders as well. We're, not, we're teachers all right, but we have to see ourselves as learners. Learning does not stop. You have lifelong learning uh, attempts or uh, um, cells or whatever you call it, units that uh, cater to lifelong learning uh, of these students. And well, we have to see ourselves as students. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, I, as I talked about, the students learn differently. So we need to be thinking about learner-centered program delivery. Okay, what that means is, as was mentioned by Professor Natarajan, um, we need to be thinking about um, offering um, programs in different ways, such as MOOC is probably something that you're looking at uh, the U.S. has kind of gone out of the MOOC discussion now because for regional institutions, MOOC does not seem to work well for them. For uh, bigger institutions who can afford it, put all of their uh, materials uh, freely available on the net, MOOC seems to be working better. Uh, the uh, cost effectiveness of uh, MOOC courses, uh, if the smaller institutions want to be involved, or a little bit is a little bit low. Uh, that's what they have learned. But what I am suggesting is that uh, it does not have to be at the MOOC level. It has to be providing access to students that may not be your traditional student. Especially that will work for rural type uh, scenarios. Uh, I taught uh, in a uh, university called University of South Dakota. University of South Dakota is uh, number one in the country for rural medicine. What it is is uh, rural medicine is actually very difficult. A healthcare, especially in rural areas, is very difficult. But they have found ways in which that will work very well. And that's uh, our answer to at least higher education is uh, in rural areas is having distance delivery, for example. 
And of course, we need to be thinking about different models for, for distant delivery and then we can have a conversation about that. The next thing we talk about is what we call outcomes-based uh, education. What's outcomes-based education? Once again, depending on who you are, you can think of an outcome as what percent of students are succeeding or passing, or what percent of students are getting placed. Am I doing better than school X? Am I doing better than school Y? And so on and so forth. The educational institutions in the U.S. look beyond those types of metrics. So for each program, they define what they call student learning outcomes that are very general. Okay, student learning outcomes, uh, for example, in a typical, say, engineering program, could be that they are able to solve or model, first of all, applications in within the context of the engineering they have learned, namely apply what they've learned. So at the end of the program or the degree, if they get 80%, 90%, 100%, that is not telling you that they're able to apply. That is telling you that they're able to write exams. Okay, so we need to find ways in which we can have them apply. So that is what I think is called project-based learning in this, uh, in, in, in India, in many institutions. And I believe some, some institutions are ahead of others, maybe very few institutions, but still uh, I've, I've uh, learned that uh, a handful of institutions at least in India are looking at project-based learning. So outcome-based education coupled with your project-based learning, whichever way you want to implement, is something that is, again, hopefully a step towards in enhancing quality. Where we are is something that you need to ask yourselves and come together and do what is called a SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, th uh, threats. The opportunities and threats for uh, GRI uh, may be different from the opportunities and threat, uh, threats for a, an urban institution. And so we need to be able to distinguish between the scenarios from one institution to the other. So that means you have a mission that you've already defined. And uh, are your programs consistent with the mission? Are they able to advance your mission? And then are your outcomes stated uh, consistently with the mission? mission statement. Those are things that we need to be looking at. The next piece that is important is often called continuous improvement. Continuous improvement is uh, often misunderstood also in the United States in many, many, many schools. Uh, it's something that we have to do, but it's not something that everyone does well or even willingly. They think of it as necessary evil because otherwise you won't get accred accreditation. So you need to do something about it. Um, what it is is the following. You are going to measure to what extent your students or your graduates are achieving the outcomes that you laid out first. That is what you need to measure, quote unquote. And then if you measure that, uh, if your measurement says your students are not achieving what outcomes you, you set out to, uh, for, the, for the specific programs, then you need to say, okay, what is it I need to change? Then you need to say, in order to make this change, this is where I need to tweak my curriculum. This is where I need to change my course. This is where I need to have more assignments. This is where I need to have more writing. This is where I need to have more speaking uh, uh, requirements. Those are the types of conclusions you make. Finally, you, having made that determination, put it back into your curriculum, and that's called closing the loop. And that's the reason why it is called continuous improvement. 
So just because you found that there is something missing and then you found it, when you changed it and then you said, let me pump it back into the curriculum, it doesn't uh, mean that you've achieved your goal because things change in the outside world, outside of this course. So two years later, after you've done, done, done this once, because things have changed, you need to improve it further. So you're going to be again uh, going back to this loop and so on. So you need to have the continuous improvement. So why I'm uh, going on these lines is because I'm heading towards what they call discipline-specific uh, accreditation, as uh, Professor Natarajan was talking about. There is institutional accreditation. There is uh, discipline-specific accreditation. The institutional accreditation is going to look at everything, not just the curriculum, not just your graduation rates, not just your uh, are you student, are you graduates employed. Okay. It is going to look at everything when you are looking for a, a, a institutional accreditation. Whereas when you are looking for a, when you are looking for discipline-specific accreditation, the faculty who teach in a particular discipline are the experts, okay, or at least we accept them as experts. So they need to know and they need to keep looking at what the outcomes are, are the students achieving those outcomes, what is missing, and then to go through the continuous improvement for those uh, disciplines. In order to do that, we still need what we call institutional support. So the processes that we follow for incorporating these kinds of changes and things like that should be non-threatening, should be uh, easy for faculty to implement so that they're able to change things in order to be successful. And that is where we need to come together. Even though we may be independently working on our discipline-specific accreditation or uh, quality assurance, we need to be looking at, okay, if I want to make a change in a particular course, how many hoops do I have to jump through? Is there, sometimes it's overwhelming. Faculty don't really like that. So we need to say, okay, well, if you ask the institution, we all agree that these to be done, everybody does it. Therefore, it's not just one person who's doing it because they like it. Uh, it is everybody that is in it, and therefore that we need to be looking for that. So the institutional support also not only comes from the point of view of infrastructure and things like that, the processes ought to be defined institution-wide in a manner that will help us uh, get there. Okay, so you've heard accreditation, you've had, heard uh, continuous improvement, you've heard curriculum, you've had faculty, all that. Well, who is it that accredits programs? What does the accreditation mean for any program? That's important. In the US, the accreditation is done by non-governmental agencies. Okay, so there are discipline-specific accreditation bodies or societies that form together accreditation agencies. They um, operate just with volunteers. I am a volunteer for ABET. ABET is accreditation board for engineering and technology programs in the world. Um, I have been uh, a program evaluator for ABET for about six years now. I made five uh, visits as an evaluator. Starting this year, I am going to be what they call a commissioner for a computing accreditation commission, which comes under ABET. And I will be chairing these review teams that go from one place to another. Every year I may be doing one or two visits like that, and it's a time-consuming process. This is something uh, that, is, that is done by, like I said, volunteers uh, who devote their time and energies for the improvement of other institutions. They are not there to find fault. They are there to help. 
uh, we go through rigorous training in terms of what to say, what not to say, uh, uh, how to help institutions achieve the quality they aspire to achieve. And you have to see it in the eyes of the institution, not in your eyes. You don't have quality uh, standards that you impose on them. They have quality standards they impose on themselves. You are only helping them to tell them, if you said this is your quality measure, this is not measuring up to that. So achieve that. And that's the uh, that's to the extent to which you need to assess their achievement. And that is we are trained very hard, you know, very rigorously to be in that mode. Okay, we are we we uh, respect all faculty of all institutions, small or big, uh, technical, non-technical, uh, whatever the programs may be, uh, but. If they say this is what they want to achieve, we just have to look at that. I mentioned processes before. Uh, accreditation, ABIT accreditation also looks at processes. Do they have a process for this? Do they have a process for that? Okay, their criteria spell them out as to where the processes are going to be important. So, going back to what can we do to improve our quality, uh, in our a particular institution is going to be based on, okay, if I want to use accreditation as a feather in my cap, okay, then I will go and read the criteria very thoroughly and then try to find out means that are going to um, address those criteria and uh, tell me or guide me as to what I should do to achieve uh, those criteria or to meet those criteria. And then present a report to the ABAT requesting them to accredit, I mean for accreditation and they will come and let you uh, let me study your uh, mission and vision statement if you will and then they will study a self, uh, study report and then make an assessment of do these activities, do these steps, meet these criteria or not, and tell you so. They don't grade you A or A plus or whatever. They tell you, you meet these uh, standards or you don't. And then they, have, uh, they uh, categorize the uh, shortcomings, if you will, any place where you're not meeting the expectations into several categories and then those will be like your grading but they don't make those grades public. It is between you and the accrediting body and that says, okay, you're close. If you do this, I will give you an accreditation for two year period and then make you accredited for a full six year period by the time, by the end of the two years, if you show me what you've done to make this gap close. That's, that's the manner in which they discuss. So, once again, the key is to use accreditation as your yardstick, whatever it may be, uh, all the criteria set forth in the by the accreditation body as your metric and then try to meet those metrics and then get some guidance from their uh, visits, from their evaluations as to how to get there. Uh, I want to let you know, I'm speaking again from experience because we had a um, very, very stressful visit in our own university when I was director, which uh, was going through accreditation of four different computer computing programs, a computer science program, an information systems, an information science, an information technology program, all simultaneously. And the report we got immediately after the visit was horrible. I'm saying that uh, because that's how the first impression could be. It doesn't mean that, you know, we're bad, our quality is bad, it's just that we did not present ourselves enough, well enough for other people to recognize it. Okay, we have to toot our own horn, hard and loud. Don't, don't be shy about it, but be truthful. 
they will find out if you're lying. So you need to be careful about how you document, how you uh, show your accountability. Those are the kinds of things that we need to do. Okay, so we've, I've talked about, you know, um, where are we, what, you know, how do we get there, and so on and so forth. I gave you some uh, buzzwords, if you will, uh, all that. So I'm going to give you one more. We call them best practices. Okay, I don't know how to do it myself. So let me go and see who has done it well and see what they're doing. And let's try and mimic it. Okay, and what should we do? Well, the best practices are always good. They may or may not fit well for our purposes, but we can, we are all uh, smart people. That's why we're here. So we can read from somebody else's uh, situation and then adapt it for our purposes. One thing that comes up, and I've had a conversation with uh, Professor Natarajan this morning, that he calls it a vision, that he calls it like for the next five years, next 10 years, next 15 years, or whatever it is. The institutions in the U.S. call it strategic planning. Strategic planning is usually for a period of five years. And again, U.S. schools also have the same scenarios as any of the higher education institutions anywhere in the world. Once every five years, the administration changes, sometimes sooner. So does that mean that our vision is going to change? Not necessarily, but at least we could be a smaller increment to from wherever we are. If you are already doing well, why do we have to change it? If you're not doing well, then definitely a change is good. So you have to look at it from that angle as opposed to changing the administration means changing something else. Okay, so look at strategic planning, even if there are going to be changes in the administration next year, year after, for a longer period of time and work towards that. And that's formulate that in terms of strategies as opposed to uh, detailed actions uh, right away. Come up with, you know, like five or six, you know, I understand that he's got like 32 principles or something, if I understand it correctly. So come up with, you know, cluster them maybe into groups and look at them as five strategies. And each strategy lists some of those initiatives. And then so with respect to each of those, you need to have this action, this action, this action, etc. So I'm going to point out a few things that you know I've considered as strategies, uh, and it has worked well in other places. Okay. Uh, one is called promoting scholarship of teaching. We're all so much interested in tying up with industries and applying our research and so on and so forth, but we also spend a lot of time in the classroom. So how do we teach something? You know, can I teach it differently? And then when you explore those different avenues for teaching, that is called the scholarship of teaching. People make uh, do publications on those. Educational institutions, uh, especially the research types, tend to shy away from that. Even when you're applying for promotion or tenure in the U.S. institutions, a person who is uh, uh, publishing something on polymers and chemistry will be considered better, quote-unquote, compared to a person who is talking about how to teach physical chemistry for the mathematically challenged. Okay, I, I suppose you get the point that I'm making here. Okay, so we need to be recognizing those people who spend energies on those kinds of initiatives as well. That is an important strategy, especially in rural type institutions, because of the population of students we serve. Okay. I have experience with regional institutions in the United States, which are somewhat equivalent to what you call rural institutions here. Okay. There are first time uh, college going folks that we need to address. There are people who uh, are adult learners that you know, are working and then want to get a degree as part time students. So those are all the different populations we serve. Therefore, 
one by one size fits all does not fit all. We need to be teaching differently for different people. And so that's the reason scholarship of teaching is good. Embracing change, that's the hardest for human beings. But we know change is the only thing that con that's constant. Okay, keep ch kind of changing and changing and changing and you need to embrace change. And as faculty, we need to change. Uh, that's why we can speed, uh, you know, bring ourselves speed, uh, you know, speed ourselves up to the speed at which the students are changing. Okay. Very often educational institutions have out-of-date facilities compared to the students. And that is true in the United States. And that is true probably everywhere else in the world as well. So we need to be thinking about how do we bridge the gap. You typically, education institutions in the U.S. have what they call a three-year refresh rate for computer equipment. Every three years, they will change their lives to have newer computers. And they'll give the older computers to the people who are doing research in, on high-performance computing to build clusters. Okay, so there's use for it, all right? So, there's, so that way it's a win-win situation because you've got good equipment for students, you've got equipment that the researcher badly needs. So you're trying to kind of uh, do a balancing act there. So those are the types of things that we need to be looking at when you want to embrace change. Community engagement is another strategy which I think Gandhi Graham is doing an excellent job on. Okay, and I mean, the more I learn about uh, uh, Gandhi Gram, the more I see how much uh, they're engaged with the community. Uh, one of the things that I have not learned yet, I need to ask more questions, is what kind of industries uh, is Gandhi Gram attached to? Okay, how much impact does the industry have in the classroom is something that uh, we can be looking at and that's something that we need to be thinking about. The last one, the faculty will appreciate this. Faculty recognition, faculty enhancement, and the last piece there is, I'm not sure how it will work in the Indian system, faculty governance. Faculty governance is something that uh, is at the root of uh, everything that uh, U.S. educational institutions do. Curriculum is, uh, uh, you know, in complete control of the faculty. When the accrediting bodies come and look at your curriculum, they see what the process is, how much faculty are involved in it. If the faculty are not involved in it, we get poor marks on uh, faculty governance. And then that's something important also. Okay, so those are all the types of things that we are talking about in terms of our best practices. Okay, what I want to do now is open up the floor up and have a conversation, and so that you know you don't get tired or fall asleep, and then I. I understand what you're learning. I am using this trip as an opportunity for me to learn. Okay, so please educate me on what you do well, where do you think you need help, where do you think we can work together and then you know, achieve quality both at both our ends.